Stephen Dorrell, Conservative MP for Charnwood and Chair of the Health Committee. Thanks very much for agreeing to do this interview with the Nuffield Trust. You've been Chair of the Health Committee since June 2010 and I wanted to sort of start at the end in a way and ask you to look forward a little bit based on your observations and your experience of over the last nearly two years of, of doing this job. In a, in two years of very extraordinary turbulence in a way, you know, what had happened, what's happened with the bill has been unprecedented and also mm -hmm. efficiency savings being needed on a scale that we've not seen before. When you look forward over the next two years and towards the election, what do you think the NHS will look and feel like for patients and the public? Are you an optimistic man? Are you a worried man about how things might, might be? Uh, I think if you spend the, as the amount of your life in politics that I have, you have to be an optimist. Uh, and I am an optimist uh, because I think that there are huge changes that can be introduced into health and social care delivery which will improve the quality of experience of the people who use the services and improve the efficiency with which resources are used and furthermore make them more rewarding places to work. I think all of that is possible. Uh, I just regret the fact that it's taking us so long uh, to walk around the edge of this issue rather than address it in the middle. Now your committee has raised concerns about the way those efficiencies are being made and in some areas not being made in a way that would, would achieve the goals that you've just set out. Since you've m made those comments and, and your report came out, any sign that the NHS has listened to that or that there's any change underway? Uh, yes, I think there is a slowly dawning recognition uh, of the importance of the efficiency gain and also the recognition that that's not just an, e an economic issue, it's actually an issue about the model of care. Uh, you don't deliver efficiency gain on that scale just by buying a bit cleverer. Uh, the only way you deliver efficiency gain on that scale is to look at the very heart of what you do uh, and address the need to, ch to ensure that what you do day by day changes to reflect, as in any economic enterprise, the changing demands of the people who use the service and the changing opportunities created by changing technology. It's the case for change. People sometimes talk about service reconfiguration as though it's an occasional event. It actually needs to be a way of life uh, for anybody working in the care system if we're going to deliver change on the scale that's necessary over the coming years. What are the markers of success then for you? What are you looking for? How will we know that that change has taken place in the right way? Well, I think one of the obvious uh, uh, weaknesses of the system currently, uh, and addressing that weakness will be one of the obvious markers of success, is the extent to which the different bits of the system, whether it's the general practitioner, the community care nurse, uh, the social worker, the social housing warden, the extent to which those people live in parallel universes, all trying to deal with the same needs of the same people. Now there seem to be quite a lot of different approaches to the sort of integration that you're describing. Are you confident that we know enough about whether integration actually exists from a patient's perspective? I, I try to avoid the word integration, it's another jargon word. What we need is joined up services. If I'm a service user, I want the different people who, in the care system who are able to help me meet my needs uh, to do it in a way that doesn't require me to repeat the same interview, doesn't require me to attend multiple clinics and just al allows it to be delivered in a way that's joined up. Now we're told that in Torbay that's as far that's as good as it gets in our system and yet if you go to Torbay uh, what you find is it's good but what it does is join up community health and social care. doesn't join up the GPs, doesn't join up the social housing, and certainly doesn't join up the hospital service. But even with that very limited interpretation of what you can join up, uh, we're told that that delivers 30% fewer acute hospital admissions than is the regional average in the southwest. Now, I'm sure there are statistical aberrations there, and it's not. A, I doubt if it's a pure statistic. But you can correct that for any number of abnormalities and still end up with something that is, a, I think, a powerful signpost, both to what you could do in the rest of the country if you did what you do now, now in Torbay, 
But perhaps even more importantly, what more you could do in Torbay if you followed the, the concept of joining up services beyond the very limited interpretation that we currently see. But who's going to make this happen? The system we've got at the moment has got you know, foundation trusts and more planned that are about getting bigger, they're about business success. Do you have any confidence that, that the new clinical commissioners are going to have any more muscle than primary care trusts have and did? Well, I think you're asking the right question, because if I go back to the beginning of the question, it was who's going to do it. And if the answer to that question isn't the commissioners, then I don't know what commissioners are there for. Uh, and you're right that different care providers want to see their activities develop. Of course they do. Uh, but they can only do that if the commissioner signs the cheque or makes the electronic transfer in this day. But the, if the commissioner makes the decision... And it's about intelligent, clinically-led commissioning that understands the changing shape of the demands placed on the system. And very importantly, also, the changing opportunities created for the system by evolving technology. Uh, clinical technology, but also much simpler things, such as information technology, that it, it, there's nothing in this sense unique to healthcare. Every uh, economic activity uh, has been re reshaped over the last 30 years uh, around new IT systems. Health, health and social care has stumbled at this fence repeatedly, but until we get that right, we'll never have properly integrated services because they have to be built around, like every other enterprise, they have to be built around properly integrated IT. Is clinical commissioning going to develop fast enough, do you think, to deliver the sorts of efficiency gains that are worrying you? Um, if you ask me whether it's going to evolve as quickly as uh, possible or as, a, a, as quickly as is perfect, the answer is no. I, we shall always be wanting to do it quicker and, and more effectively. Uh, I do think that the commitment to a commissioner, a, clinically commission, uh, a clinical commissioner-led system is real, uh, but it's still, it's barely taken root. If you move forward from the bill, uh, what we need to be doing uh, is ensuring that the messages going into the system uh, make it clear that those who want to see change in the way care is delivered should be empowered and promoted and those who think that health and social care is about continuing to do what we've always done uh, will have their practices constantly, relentlessly challenged. And you're confident that we've got the structures in place to, in, in, to, to communicate that view of the future? I am confident the structures can do the job. Are they perfect? They never are. But if, you, uh, we've, if there was a perfect way of managing the health and care system, I guess we'd have probably stumbled across it somewhat sometime in the last 60 years. It certainly isn't for want of looking. Uh, I, I think the question is a slightly different one. Will these structures uh, make it impossible for you to do what you need to do? No, I don't think they do. Uh, do they allow you to do what you've got to do? Yes, I think they do. So get on and do it. So where will the, your, the energy of your committee be going first in the next sort of year or so? Well, I, we shall certainly be looking at what's going on in the, within the government at the moment around social care, uh, because planning health divorced from social care is one of the fundamental mistakes. Just on the social care question, the funding issue needs a resolution. It needs it urgently. It's been said by many people most recently by the Dilnot Commission. Do you sense that there is any political appetite to resolve this, given that these are not huge sums of money. On the other hand, any extra revenue raising that appears to have an impact on perhaps the better off sections of the older community seems to create a sort of shrieking noise in the political world. Well, I think that if uh, Dilnot is seen as being, uh, the, or the question in Dilnot is seen as being, how do you ref or change the financing of the tr existing structures? It is the wrong question. What I think we need to be doing uh, is articulating the kind of view I've been describing of a more joined up service and then saying how do we pay for the social care elements of that while preserving uh, the definitions of what's free and what's charged for. 
Uh, and I think that's a much easier question to answer uh, than trying to uh, put in place revised funding for a rather out-of-date view of what you're trying to fund. Stephen Doyle, thank you very much. Thank you.